get discouraged, but they do, and uh, I being one, so I need your prayers, and I need your attention for about an hour. We're going to have our radio broadcast that we do each Sunday morning, beginning at 9 o'clock. I'm explaining why I'm here. Huh? Oh. And there's confusion. So, good, now we can start. All right. We'd like to welcome all of our friends out there in KPRO 1570, 
We thank you for joining us. You are receiving this at nine o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning, but we record it each Sunday afternoon here in uh, Ukaipa at the Women's Club at the corner of Adams and A Street. And again, we would like to remind you that we are on Thursday, beginning at 1 o'clock, 1570, all of the numbers, 1570 on the dial, AM. And also, Friday, from 2 until 3. That's an entirely different uh, broadcast that we do on Thursday and Friday. This we preach, and on Thursday and Friday, we tend to get into teaching subject matters that are pertinent to the very day that we're living in. And we're thankful for the individuals who have been kind enough to uh, help us with the broadcast. And while we're talking about it, we might as well throw it out there in faith that there might be someone that is interested in helping us. We have, of the three days, two of them are taken care of for a year. Some good people decided that they would help us out in that. And again, we're very thankful. But if there is someone out there that the Spirit of God might touch your heart, your mind, and your spirit to help us so that we don't have to worry about the cost of the radio broadcast. As I said, we have two of the three that are already taken care of for the year. That's why you never hear us uh, begging for money or even asking for money. But on this occasion, I would like to get one more of an individual that would help us in that area. It's approximately 1,224. 24, my information center just kicked in. <laughs> So we got $2,400 We paid for one a year of broadcasting. So consider it. Say, well, do you really think that somebody is going to do that? I really do because it's already happened twice. So we are thankful again. We have on the Thursday and Friday broadcast, as I mentioned, been speaking in the area of the book of Ephesians regarding God's church. There's a description that is set forth in the fifth chapter, and for the sake of time, I will just go from verse 26 and 27. Speaking of the church here, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word. You cannot read that without having the Spirit of God to rise up in your heart, your spirit, and remind you that it is by the blood 
that we are cleansed, that our sins have been washed, and that we have been born into the kingdom of God. Here, the Lord, via the Holy Spirit, writing to us and, I believe, reminding us through the writer Paul that there is a further cleansing. I'll put it that way. You still have the same body that you had when you went to the altar or called upon the name of the Lord. You're still walking around in the same physical body. You have primarily now, a lot of people would want to jump in here and argue with this one, but if you argue very long, you would prove my point, that you still have basically the same carnal nature to deal with. Your family, I've said for years, I'll say it again. If your wife doesn't know you're saved, you're not saved. If your family doesn't know that you're saved, you're not saved. Just because that you say that you are doesn't make it so. It is by the watching and the looking and the actions of you and I as believers that people will make up their own mind of how much of this word has taken root in your life and how much of it is active in your life. So for assistance, now this is after you have been saved, as we refer to it, or born again. Here he's telling us and using the words of Jesus on the great day that he cried out, I have water to drink. If you drink of this water, you shall never thirst again. So when we come to understand that there is a further cleansing the old timers of my day, they used to use the term that you got sanctified. We don't believe that no more, so we quit preaching it. I still believe in it myself. It says so right here in the 26th verse that he might sanctify. That's an old fashioned word. New modern Christianity doesn't like old-fashioned words. They are removing as much of the blood that they can out of this book. They are removing as much as possible, referring to the cross. It's too hideous. It's too bloody. People don't want to hear it. They want you to tell them how good they are. They want you to tell them how wonderful that they are. But this book deals with you and I as we are. So, the writer under the influence of the Spirit of God declares here that he might cleanse, sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word, 27th verse, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy, speaking of the church, 
that it would be holy and without blemish. Now let me just refresh your mind that the spots and the wrinkles and the any such thing, Peter tells us who they are. They are individuals that are sitting right there many times in the pew with you or in the building with you. And he said there's one problem that they have. And the problem is that they cannot cease from sin. It is not that the word of God has not already dealt with that situation. It is now that religion has intervened and placed new ideas and we call it religion and that's why that from time to time we remind you that religion is a sickness. It can't do anything for you. And you say, what about the good religion that the Bible talks about? Well, if you got that one, then you're agreeing with what I say. If you have been born truly of the Spirit of God, washed and cleansed in His blood, and you are by daily activity using the Word of God to continue to cleanse you right down to the marrow of the bone and cleanse you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, and give you an empowerment as told to us in John, the first chapter, 12th verse, that he says, I give you power to become sons of God. Now, I got to stop myself right there because if I don't, I'll take off and be gone for 45 minutes in the spirit part of it. So I'm going to put the brakes on because I have something that I want to share with you that are here and listening. Now, there is another word that confuses God's people. And that word is perfection. It makes no difference how many times that you tell someone or you preface the statement that God is coming for a perfected work. They are always going to go back to the flesh and they'll say their favorite saying in the world of religion, well, nobody's perfect. They love that phrase. Well, nobody's perfect. We all do a little sinning once in a while. And uh, on and on, we keep throwing out this rhetoric of religion. And God wants us to return to the word and find out what he said, not what men think that he said. So turn the page, if you are in a place that you have your Bible, back to chapter 4. And we're going to read beginning with the 11th verse. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For what purpose did he set these into the body of Christ? The next verse, 12, tells us the reason, the purpose. Now it's interesting because the church does not know and have not accepted the idea that there are apostles alive today, that there are prophets. We got a few pastors, we accept those, evangelists and teachers. Most everybody today is a teacher, whether they've been called or sent, doesn't matter. Give me somebody's ear and I'll beat the drum and I'll tell you all about it. That's not the calling that God is talking about here. Again, the 12th verse, for the perfecting of the saints. 
where I was reading just a moment ago over in the fifth chapter, he uses the analogy in the 24th and the 25th verse of the marriage between the husband and the wife. The reason that he uses that is whether you know it or not, if you're a member of a church or you are a member of the body of Christ, when you get married in the commonwealth of the church, God ceases to look at you as two different people. He looks at you as one. That's what the Bible says about being married. He looks at you as being one. The reason he uses the analogy here is is because he wants you to understand that he is to be married to you. In other words, you and he are to become one. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, I just read it to you. You have the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and teacher for the perfecting of the saints. But if the church has already threw up, thrown out two of them, and they've thrown out the law, the word of God, they threw it out, and the half of them, or two-thirds of them, don't even believe in the, the spirit of God, and more than a third of the people preaching don't even believe in the birth of Jesus Christ as being without the assistance of a male. So the church is in a mess. The church is in a mess. Why? Because they have come up with their own religion. That's why we continue to tell you that religion is a true sickness that we need a healing from. God will help you if you desire to understand his word. He said if you have need of assistance, of wisdom and knowledge, ask and he shall give it to you. Many people say I just don't understand the Bible. It's because that you have left out one of the items that God says I'm willing to give it to you as a gift and that is the gift of the Holy Ghost. In other words, you have the author that is willing to come and sit down in your heart and your mind and to teach you the word of God, not only in the ministry of preaching the word of God, but right there in your own home, God says, I'll be right there with you. I will lead you and guide you in the truth and yes, I'll bring you to the state of perfection if you desire it. Glory. Well, we got one amen. Glory to God. <laughs> so, in the 12th verse, let me go back and again read it. We're not speaking of perfection of the flesh. You can say that a thousand times or more and the next time, 1,001, that you have a conversation with your friend or your buddy about the Word of God, he or she is always going to go back to that one area. Well, nobody's perfect. And they are looking at you when they say it. And they're not going to accept the fact that he's not speaking here of perfection in the flesh. He is speaking of maturity of utilizing not only the word of God but being led by the spirit of God for the purpose of getting you and I in tune with him and what he's going to do in this last day this thing is not over the church's warfare is not over in fact in many cases it's just getting started and I, we're gaining we're gaining a little more 
rim. Let me go back over here to the 24th verse of the 5th chapter of the book of Ephesians. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Again, he's using the analogy, the picture of marriage. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. For what purpose? For the joining together, for the being married to him, for the purpose of becoming one with him. It's a many-membered body, so is your physical body. He uses that from time to time. That the physical body is a picture of his church. You got all kinds of things going on. You got a heart in there pumping blood to every part of your body. You got a brain sitting up there. It's got, it's got an alert brain that's looking at everything around it. It's got the subconscious mind that is working all of the vital organs of the body and making everything function, and he's got it all under control, and if you cooperate with it and feed it right and take care of it, it will, in the, in the long run, it'll take care of you. It's the same identical thing in the church. If you allow the Spirit of God with the Word of God, with the ministry of God, He said, I can get you to the state of perfection. Jesus said, I have come to do what? I have come to give you life. Not only life in this world, but life eternal. You and I are walking right now in eternal life. Why? Because we come here as dead souls. We were dead to the things of God. We had no love of the word of God. And we were too busy entertaining our flesh in the world. But one day, thank God that the Holy Ghost came and knocked at the door of your heart and asked that you would have him to come in. And you were uh, capable that day of having the sense in your mind and spirit to say the Lord, come on in and wash me and cleanse me and purge me and make me one of yours. That's still a day that I shout about every once in a while. Glory to God. Now let me return back Turn the page back over. Chapter 4. Go back to verse 12 again. And I got to explain it again. We're not speaking of perfection of the flesh. We are speaking of the perfection of the work of salvation under the tutorage of the fivefold ministry can produce something. And that's something that it can and will produce if you allow it for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying. You know what the word edify means. It's to build up, to make strong. When you're down, when I started this message, I was down. I'm anywhere, every, I'm everywhere else than down right now because I'm in the spirit and I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost here, so I'm no longer down, but I'm soaring in God's heaven. Hallelujah. Why? Because I believe what he wrote. <laughs> First, first of all, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, 13th verse, listen to what he says. Till we all come. Where does he want us to come? In the unity of the faith. Go back there and read if you want to understand a little bit more about it. Go back, read Psalms 133. If you don't want to go back there, just read from in the book of Acts and find out what you got. 
He came on the day of Pentecost as a rushing mighty wind. He gave Peter a backbone that he didn't have. The man couldn't even testify to a little girl, but when the power of the Holy Ghost came, not only could he talk to a little girl, but he got right out in the middle of the street and declared, by cruel hands you have killed the glorious one that God has sent to us. And he began to preach the wonders of God and they had a revival right there in Jerusalem and God is ready to send another revival right here, right now in America. Well, that wouldn't run no good. Give me an amen on that one. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Here we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He measures us by the word. You are going to be judged, and I, I, I tell you, it still brings fear into my heart, my mind, and my spirit when I think about it. You're going to be judged for every idle word. Oh, my Lord. I have to quickly think about just one or two little silly things that I said yesterday that probably shouldn't have been said. Oh, Lord. I, I, you know, you start asking the Lord, can you rub that one out? No, there's a law in here. If you plant it, it'll grow. So you better watch out what you're planting because you are going to get a crop. So we, bet we must begin to serve ourselves and the kingdom of God by sowing good seed into the earth or into the church. You say, well, my church doesn't I believe in that. Well, you ought to get out of that church. It can't help you. It doesn't know what's going on in the word of God. God is going to have a people in the last day that is raised up by the power of the Holy Ghost. And these fivefold ministries are going to come alive. I preached that here for the first year and I finally got tired of trying to convince anybody, so I quit preaching it for about a year. Well, I'm back on it now because God is looking for men and women that are willing to be set into the body of Christ and that they can become messengers of hope. And yes, your tongue can become a tree of the living God. That whatever you say will have an anointing upon it. Whatever you do, God is watching over it. Wherever you might go, he goes before you, and he, God, is there to take care of you. My Lord. You're not going to shout, so <laughs> I might as well go on. That was a shouting phrase right there. If we were in the other church, we'd have people running down the aisle. When I preach in Tennessee, the people run the aisles. We don't do that out here in California. We're more, well, whatever. <laughs> Go back to the 14th verse now of the fourth chapter. That we henceforth be no more children. You know, when you read Paul's letter, to 1 Corinthians, the first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, Paul preached and talked just like you and I need to hear it right now. So let me read a little bit of it for you. Third chapter, 1 Corinthians. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Now he's speaking to a church that looked upon itself and others looked upon it as being the high watermark of Christianity. The church at Corinth 
was looked upon as being the high water mark, walking in tall cotton. But Paul says, I have fed you with milk. So everything that was going on that they thought was so wonderful, Paul's evaluation of it was, it's nothing more than milk. He said, God's got three levels of word for you. And you're still sucking on the bottom. When I think of that, I look around someplace. We got Brother Marvin sitting here. Nice looking fellow, all dressed up. Looks nice. Yeah, yeah, sit up there, brother. <laughs> We're looking at you. Now, you put him, now visualize this. Put him in a baby carriage. Put a big old bottle in his mouth. And he's sitting there or laying there in it. And all he's goo-gooing and slopping that stuff all over the place. Why? Because he's a baby. Paul says you're babies and you need to learn something. God has got some meat for you. He's got some strong meat that you need to have in your body. Why, you can't feed strong meat to a baby. You will kill the poor child. But I tell you, when you begin to mature and you begin to grow in the word of God, this word becomes real and it begins to expand and you get out of the manna stage and you begin to eat manna from heaven. Glory to God. I beseech, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For here too, ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. I can tell you one thing they were getting mad about now. They were getting upset. He's calling us babies. He says we're not mature. Now, he gives you the next one, the third verse. For ye are yet carnal. Now I know there's no carnality in your church. We're just talking about the church down the way here. We're not talking about us or whoever's listening out there. Certainly not talking about your church. But let's find out if we might be talking about your church. For ye are yet come, for whereas there's among you envy. I know you don't have no envy in your church. Strife. There's no strife in your church. And divisions. Are ye not carnal? And walk as men? You see, Paul hadn't learned our theology of this day. Because everybody is wonderful today. Everybody's going to heaven. It doesn't matter what you do with your physical body. God's not interested in your physical body. Your Bible might say that, but mine says that he saved you body, soul, and spirit. He gave you the whole works now, it's a matter of, do you accept what he gave you? I'm walking in the light. I might be in the world of darkness. I hear people all the time using that for, oh, it's so dim and dark in this poor world. And we're just striving to get to the end. Oh, my, I don't know what we're going to do. Listen, shake yourself, the prophet said. Stand up, shake yourself. Get rid of the cobwebs of this world that you're living in and declare something. I'm walking in heavenly places. Why? Because he's got me by the hand. And he's leading me. And he's guiding me. Where? To a higher realm in himself. For the glory of God to be manifested through me. All right, my, 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 my. What a promise that we have. Let me read just a little bit further. I don't want to keep jumping on your case. But I know everybody heard this. You got it in your church. I was on the radio in Phoenix. And uh, our church was out in uh, Scottsdale. 
And uh, <laughs> we were on two hours a day, talk show. Woman called me up. She said, I'm tired of hearing you talk about these things are in uh, every church. She said, not in my church. I said, really? What's the name of your church if you have the courage to tell us? What's the name of your church? She told us one of the, it was one of the uh, churches out of Tennessee. Church of God. There's about a dozen of them down there, so take your pick. And she said, well, I want you to quit saying that because it's just not true. And I said, I'm not going to keep, I'm not going to quit saying it. I'm going to keep on saying it because it's the truth. She said, why you blankety blank blank thing you? I said, now we really know what's in your church. You tricked me. You made me mad. I said, I didn't put nothing in you. You put everything in you. You hold, you're holding on to everything that you had in the world and you're trying to bring it into the church. It doesn't work. It won't work. Why? Because he said, I've taken you out of the world and I've taken the world out of you and you ought to be walking in the light as he is the light. Glory to God. But while one saith, I am a Paul, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Pentecostal. Oh, now I'm talking about the Pentecostals. I've got been one all my life. We're the worst group of the whole lot of them. Amen. Got a few amens on that one. If you don't believe that, get to know some of us. You'll find out something. That we can dance and shout down at the church house. But we forget to take him home with us. And we have a bad attitude and a bad spirit. And we're always looking for something to pick something out on somebody else. Get your eyes off of your neighbor. Get your eyes off of your husband. Get your eyes off of your wife. And get them on to yourself. And let the power of the Holy Ghost lead you into the Word of God so you can find out something. You don't have to stay in that state. God said, I'll wash you, purge you, cleanse you, and make you one of mine if you want me to do it. Glory to God. Just a little more. This gets real personal here. So he says in the fifth verse, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. If there's going to be any increasing in your life, it's going to be God doing it. Hide the word in your heart that you might not sin against the Lord is a reality that you can have to come alive in your heart and you can walk in that understanding that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That doesn't mean once in a while. That means every 24 hours rolls around that you and God are one and he's taking you to a higher and higher and higher level. Glory to God. Go back over there into Psalms 133 again. You know what it says there? It makes it very clear. It makes it very clear that wherever the Spirit of God is poured out, that God will do this for you. He will make you come alive in Him. Go over there and read it for yourself. I don't have time to go over there and read it. But I'm making the connection back now into the New Testament. Because the picture is this. 
that you got to be in one place, <laughs> one mind. That doesn't mean your mind or my mind. It's not a Baptist mind or a Lutheran mind or a Pentecostal mind or Seventh-day Adventist mind. No, it's none of those minds. It is one mind. And that mind is the mind of Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ. That's the mind that he's looking for. Because when you get into that, you know what happens? You can experience all by yourself. What happened on the day of Pentecost? You will be walking in the Spirit and you will be lifted up to high places in God and there he will feed you heavenly manna and revelation, revelation, revelation will become your portion. Why? Because God is looking for people. I said God is looking in this day. Come out of her, my people. You know how we use that today? On any other church other than our own. Need to come out of that group. Need to come out of that group. Come over here in our group. We got it right. As far as I know right now, including myself. We're still looking. We're still waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ in us as becoming the glorious event that will bring Jesus Christ back to his church once again. I said it will bring him once again. Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. Who was talking? The physical man Jesus was talking. I got to get the flesh out of the way. As long as I'm here in this one body, I cannot be in you. But if I go away, I'll come again. I'm not waiting for him to come. I'm not waiting for him to fly down out of the sky in the heavenly realm. Why? Because I read in the book of Acts that he came on the day of Pentecost. And he's been leading and guiding the church ever since. And we've been victorious all down through history. He's kept that church. They tried to destroy it time and time again. We're in the middle of that right now going on in America. There for the first time in this country. There are laws that are being made up just for bringing the church to a halt. They're working feverishly to bring about a weakening of the church of the living God. They weakened it when they said, we don't want you, Lord, no more in our school. Well, go back and find out when that happened. Come forward from that day to this day. Sin and darkness have flooded this nation of America. Why? Because the little bit of understanding that we got went a long, long way. Now you can't even have the Ten Commandments out in front of a courthouse. They had a big two-year fight down in Alabama. A judge had it up in his chamber, wanted out of there. They marched against it. They marched against the plaque. They marched. Why? We don't want God anywhere to do with our government. I'm going to tell you something. It's evident that God has heard America saying, we don't want you no more. Why? Because he's removed the protection. We were attacked on our own ground. And if you don't have a repenting nature in this country fairly soon, you're really going to have problems. Why? Because God is not going to leave you in the state that you're in. He loves you too much to leave you there. Well, I would go a little further with it. But I think I'll switch it and go back 
to the book of Ephesians once again. And what he says, 27th verse. In conclusion now, we're getting close to the end of our broadcast. Got about 12 minutes to go. So let me interject this. 27th verse of the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. That he might present it to himself. What is the it? <laughs> That's the church. The bride. I said the bride. You think this church world out here is a bride? Anything but. They got bad spirits, bad ideas, bad directions. All they're interested in is how many people they got, how much money they got in the bank, how prestigious they might be. God is interested in none of that. God is interested in one thing. Will you take my word and will you allow it to become food for your soul? Will you understand it's a whole lot better than barbecue? It's a whole lot better than a steak dinner. Why? Because this is revelation truth that God is sharing with us today. He wants you to know something. That you are not destined to stay in the state of the first Adam. But he wants to take you to the second Adam. He wants to make of you a quickening spirit that you might have the word of God to come alive in you. And every word in the book becomes a part of your destiny. And whatever promise he has made belongs to you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Again, without spot and without wrinkle or any such thing. That's the thing that he is interested in. Now, when I was there a few moments back, I didn't go, I just alluded to the fact of Second Peter. So go over there with me to Second Peter and let's find out what these spots and blemishes are. Second Peter, second chapter, and we're going to begin with the 13th verse. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots, they are, and blemishes. What are they doing? Sporting themselves with their own deceiving. That's religion, friend. That's religion. You say, not my church. No, your church, my church, and every other church. We're cranked up on religion. We're all hyped up on religion. God wants us to find out something. That that greater one, he's willing to come. He's willing to step down in your heart, your mind. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the living God. God wants to walk with you. God wants to talk with you. God wants to commune with you. God wants to heal you. God wants to deliver you. God wants to save your family from the wreckage of this world that we're living in. God is waiting to have somebody right now call out to him that is listening to this broadcast and say, Lord, come into my heart. He'll do it right there. Glory to God. Do you preach this way all the time? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you this noisy? Absolutely. A friend of mine told me, you got to quit preaching like that, man. You're getting too old to be preaching like that. Well, I didn't listen to it. He quit preaching, went and sat down, down in Mexico. He's going fishing. He's enjoying himself. I'm still having fun preaching. 
Why? Because there's unsearchable riches in here. There are things here in the Word of God that I haven't explored yet. I think of old Job. You go way back there. They tell us that that was the first book possibly that was ever written. I won't argue with you. Let's make it that. Go ahead. Find with me. So go all the way back there at the very beginning of it all. But I'm going to tell you something. Job didn't stay back there. I said Job didn't stay back there because Job got a revelation of what was going to happen. And Job, as he was sitting there dying with the canker sores and, and the flesh being eaten away from him, and in that state of almost death, Job got a revelation of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he said, with these eyes shall I behold him. He came all the way up to where we're at right now. He got a revelation. I'm trying to tell you out there. Get a revelation of who Jesus Christ is in you. He'll take you from the state of your first Adam. And say come on child. I'm going to take you up to the state of the second Adam. You will become a new creature in Christ Jesus. You don't have to stay in that state of the first Adam. No, you come to the state of the second Adam and let him lead you and guide you into the glorious truth that Christ in you is the hope of glory. I think of that every time. Every time that I hear people talking about what we can't have and where we're stuck. You can have everything and you're not stuck nowhere except where you stick yourself. If you're stumbling around and missing it, quit blaming your wife or your husband or your children or the job or the school or on and on. None of those are the problems. There's only one that's the problem. That's you. I said that's you. You're the problem. Because the moment that you allow Jesus Christ to come in and he begins to cleanse you and wash you and purge you, then as we read in the book of Ephesians, he begins to feed you of the heavenly manna and he begins to let you know something. I gave you life eternal and you're just beginning on a journey that has no end. It's, there is no ending to this thing. Why? Because the God that we are a part of, there is no beginning, there is no ending, and you now entered in to the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is the great and mighty God. Yes, he's the glorious God. Yes, he's the bright and morning star. He is the bright and morning star. He is the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. He is God of all gods. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Let me wrap this up. Let me finish up what I was reading to you there in 2 second, second Peter, 2nd second chapter. Now, I'm at the 14th verse. Now what is the problem? He wraps it up for us. He tells us exactly what the problem is. Having eyes full of adultery. Now there's more than one kind of adultery. There's physical adultery and there's spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. Buy the truth, sell it not. Millions of people out here bought the truth when they called upon the name of the Lord. But they let somebody called a preacher take it away from them. I said they let somebody call a preacher. Tell them you can't have that. That doesn't belong to you. That's back there somewhere. No, 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 no. God's promises are everlasting to everlasting. And God wants you to know something. 
that if it's in this book, you can have it. I said, you can have it. Quit making everybody God's people except the ones that are truly His people. The ones that are truly of His people are washed in the blood, impregnated by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, filled with the very presence of God. This book comes alive and you get like Job. <laughs> I shall see him with these eyes. Glory to God. What a promise. Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Did somebody talk you into saying that you got to do a little sinning? Don't worry about it. We got a good piece of uh, material here. The church loves the devil. Oh, they love the devil. They go get him every time that something goes wrong. They dig him out, set him up. The devil made me do it. Old Flip Wilson made millions of dollars just by using a phrase. They built a whole sitcom around it. And he was on every Saturday or Sunday night and he was always saying, the devil made me do it. The church world has been saying that since conception. Go back there to the garden. Eve said what? <laughs> the devil, the snake made me do it. Who did, who did Adam blame? He blamed God. I was doing all right till you give me that woman. And that lying spirit has been in man's heart and mind ever since that day. Let me tell you something out there that are listening by, by radio. We've got to leave you at this point in time. But I want to tell you something. Get rid of your props. Get rid of all of these things that you want to blame. And get a hold of God and let him wash you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. And let him fill you up with the word of God. And learn how to walk in the spirit. And even yes, becoming one of the manifested sons of God. God bless you. Amen. And amen. The Lord, he is good. I was thinking... When I started this out, my God, I'm going to find some way to, yes, I'm find some way to get out of this. I'm glad I didn't. Whether you enjoyed it or not, I enjoyed it. 